hello and welcome everybody. I was just thinking, I don't know if I've ever been in a room with this many cat lovers all together. Um, and for me, that is pretty fantastic. It's so nice to see so many of you. So today I'm going to be talking very, very much about getting the environment right for our cats. Um, we provide an environment for them as our pet species, and we therefore have the responsibility to make sure that we get that right. So just to start off with, um, my presentation will be lots and lots of photos, so you really can sit back and, and relax and, and watch these. But we see on the left-hand side here we have cats. They all look relatively happy. We keep them in lots and lots of different environments, whether that's boarding catteries, rescue shelters, within the veterinary practices and hospitals, short-term and long-term, and within our home. And for some cats, some parts of that environment can change and they can cope okay. But for other cats, just the smallest environmental change can lead to problems for that cat. So we can see problems in their health, and we see in the photograph here uh, a cat that's um, suffering eye infection, conjunctivitis. We see problems relating to upper respiratory infections, lower urinary tract disease. We can see problems with their psychological welfare, their, their well-being. Um, so through stress and anxiety if the environment isn't right. The photograph there of the, the lady's leg was when a dog was introduced to the home. Um, the cat could no longer cope and at flash points, entry exit points, when the dog was coming into the home, the cat redirected onto this lady's leg. A really quite severe cat bites. Um, and then we see where psychological stress can manifest itself um, in physical welfare problems. So the last picture we see is um, an over-grooming cat. So we have this recognize, we, we now recognise how important the environment is in maintaining the psychological and physical welfare of our cats. Um, and through that recognition, the American Association of Feline Practitioners and the International Society of Feline Medicine decided to get together to produce some best practice guidelines, so some information that's freely available for everybody to say what is the best environment for our cats. Um, so that panel was co-chaired by myself and Alona Rodan um, and we were a panel of uh, feline behaviour experts, uh, veterinarians, sp uh, feline specialists um, and research scientists. So a really, really nice team actually that could provide the evidence base and the first-hand experience. Those guidelines are freely available. You can download them from the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. Um, you have a shortened version in your preceding pack. Um, and they've been endorsed by the American uh, Animal Hospital Association. Now, we chose the word environmental needs rather than environmental enrichment or environmental modification, which you might have heard before, because we really believed that these were something that was an absolute for cats. They needed them. It wasn't something that made their life from adequate to enriched. Um, it was an absolute basic need of these animals to maintain their welfare. And really, where do they fit in for, for you guys as, as veterinarians and allied professions? We know when we have an inappropriate environment, this can lead to behaviour and health problems. And the first point of call for most owners, unfortunately sometimes after the internet, is, is the vet. That will be the first point of call. So the veterinary teams really can utilise these guidelines in providing education to their cat owners. Through implementing the guidelines, you could lead to cats that are much, much happier. And as Vicky will go on, happier cats will certainly equal happier owners. Um, and you're retaining those clients within the practice. So we've covered some of the benefits there of, um, of, of creating the right environment, following these guidelines, um, improved recognition of uh, disease, less illness, um, a strengthened bond between human and cat. Easier handling, if the cat is much happier in an environment, it's going to be easier to handle, which means you're going to get easier recognition of, of illness. Um, fewer unwanted behavioural problems, a whole range of benefits we can, we can get from this. So what exactly is an environmental need for a cat? Um, I know my environmental needs before I come up on stage, and that's definitely to go to the loo several times. I think probably a loo trip for every row of people. Um, to have two glasses of water, just in case I run out. Um, but what about cats? What do they need from their environment? 
And what do we mean by environment? Well, the environment encompasses both the social and the physical environment. That environment indoors for our cats that reside within our homes, but also the outdoor environment too. And for those cats who don't have outdoor access, if they have a window that looks out into the outdoors, you still need to take into consideration that outdoor environment because it will be influencing their behaviour. And the social environment, their interactions with us, with other cats if we're in a multi-cat household or within a veterinary practice where they're caged alongside other cats and with other species within the home if they're living with others. We have to consider the biology of the cat if we want to understand its needs as well as understanding where the cat has come from, who it has evolved from and how many of these behaviours has it retained. The cat's very um, relatively recently domesticated in the last 10,000 years or so, and it has retained very much um, the behaviour of its wild ancestor. And we need to take these into account um, when we're considering the needs that it has from its environment. So I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. Um, I know for those of you that were at this conference last year, a lot of this was covered and Vicky will be picking up on some of the bits and expanding them. Um, so I'm going to go through quite quickly what is a cat and then we'll really focus the majority of the talk on, on what these needs are and how we can implement them. So the first thing that's most important is the cat is a solitary hunter. It has evolved from a solitary hunter and still today if it hunts it will do so on its own. Um, the African wildcat would hunt between 10 and 20 small prey per day and it's been suggested that up to about half of those hunts can be unsuccessful. So a huge amount of energy is expended and time devoted to trying to find food. Because they're solitary hunters, avoidance and evasion are absolutely critical. It's very, very costly if you get injured when you don't rely on anybody else for help. The cat not only is a solitary hunter, it's a solitary survivor. If you depend entirely on yourself for food, you depend entirely on yourself for survival. And the cat has a number of coping strategies um, that, that aids its survival. So it's very, very vigilant. It will always be looking out for real or perceived threats and it has certain methods of dealing with these. The first and one of the most common is flight. If it sees something it doesn't like or it senses maybe dangerous to it, it will flee from that area. And it may well flee to a hiding place. The second thing then is hiding. A cat will always find a place of safety or perceived safety from which it can be vigilant and look out for, to its environment. The last thing it's likely to do, and this really is in a last case scenario, is to fight. And this is really only when the cat perceives it's trapped and it has no other mechanism for, for flight or for hiding. Um, again, it would be very, very costly to be involved in a fight and risk injury. When I try to describe to people what a cat is who don't work with cats, I always describe the cat as the ultimate control freak. Um, they really need a sense of control over their environments. And a lot of that we provide to them by giving them a perceived sense of control. They need familiarity, they need routine, and they need predictability. And we actually have quite a strong evidence base now from scientific studies of examples where cats need these and do better when they have these available to them, particularly in laboratory cat studies and rescue welfare studies. The cat has evolved from a highly territorial species um, and it still has a preference for familiar territory which will contain its core resources, the area where it sleeps, where it rests. Um, it will maintain safety of that area, whether it's real or perceived, and it will actively defend that area through a, a, a whole range of um, communication, so through vocalisation, scent marking, through its physical presence, where it will turn side on and make itself really big and defend that area, say, look how big I am, don't dare come in here. Um, and through its physical activity, through fighting at the last resort. And this photograph um, here is, is a nice example of um, two cats in a home. This cat very much is protecting the upstairs area and spends a lot of time blocking um, by just sitting on the stairs 
so that this cat utilises its flight mechanism and doesn't have access to the upstairs. And again, some more photographs just to illustrate. This would be what I call the classic moonwalk. I'm sure you've all seen that when two cats meet and one cat is trying to defend its, its uh, space. Um, the other cat will move its flight maybe very, very slow. It may just leave like this because if it goes fast, it's likely to elicit a chase. And a chase is likely to end in injury. So we often see um, this very, very slow walking away. And we have mentioned that on occasion, when other options aren't available to them, the cats will use the coping mechanism of fighting. And when they do, they are very much armed with weapons, the claws on each paw and their teeth, and they can do quite serious injuries. I also just want to mention the cat's social structure. The cat is an entire, a really, really flexible species in terms that it can exist as a solitary animal, and exist in a highly complex social group. Now, when we say that, we don't mean one particular cat can do that. I think a lot of owners get mixed up and they think, oh, he can live on his own, or he can live with friends and I'll get friends for him. That's not the case. We're talking about the cat as a species, not an individual. So there are certain rules, if you like, that will determine whether a cat will live with others or not. And these re rely very much on their distribution of food. So a cat that hunts small prey that's patchily distributed will, will live alone. Um, and where there's large clumped food resources, such as on farms or at docklands or people putting out food for cats, they may come together in a group. And we find from our um, free-ranging cat studies that they're generally females and related. And they will act very hostile to non-group members. Within our domestic home, within our pet setting, this is often the case, but it's not a hard and fast rule. It's important to think that there are other things beyond just food and relatedness that influence whether cats will get on. On the left-hand side, these are uh, three of my cats. This is um, an ex-stud and two siblings. So this cat is unrelated to these two. Because they were introduced at a young age of these two, they have maintained a positive social relationship into adulthood. However, these cats, these, are, were, uh, these two were my grandmother's cats, and this is their uncle who lives two doors down. And he actively drove out um, one of his nephew, sorry, one of his nephews. Um, but they were not able to live within the same street, these related males. Um, so, Cats can exist together in groups, but not always, and it's not for every cat. And finally, we need to understand their, their um, sensory capabilities and how they communicate. Their sensory capabilities are very much developed to aid hunting, to identify familiar animals, to defend their territories, to protect themselves from threats, and to avoid physical fights. Their vision is very much developed um, to be most sensitive in low light conditions. And it's very, very sensitive and acute to fast moving objects. So it's really developed for, for locating prey. Um, their sense, acute sense of smell and their ability to utilize pheromones through the highly developed vermiceral nasal organ um, helps them familiarize with their environment and communicate with their own species. Their auditory capabilities are very much tuned in to high frequency, the sounds um, at frequencies which their uh, prey would make. And vocalizations are really, they, they are used in cat-cat communication, but they're used much, much more in cat-human communication. It's something that we seem to, to reinforce and have developed. So, that was really a whistle-stop tour of the cat, and I'm sure most of you already knew all of that, so it's a nice um, reminder. But really what I want to base most of this talk on is what we call our five pillars of the healthy feline environment. So these are our environmental needs. As a team, we identified five that we were thought the most important, and we've called these the five pillars. The first is to provide a safe place. I think we'll all agree that for any of us, a safe place is really, really core to functioning. 
The second is to provide multiple separated key environmental resources. And that's a bit of a mouthful. What do we mean by multiple and separated? And I'll come on to that and explain that. The third is to provide an opportunity for play and predatory behavior. The fourth is to provide consistent and predictable human-cat social interaction. Now, I'm not going to cover that much on that at all because that's very much the basis of Vicky's talk afterwards, so we will we'll skim over that one. And the fifth and final is to provide an environment that respects the importance of a cat's sense of smell. And when I talk about smell, I'm also talking about chemical signals and pheromones. <coughs> 